Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of our Seven Investing Podcast, where it's our mission to empower you to invest in your future. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson. You can learn more about our Seven Investing research and our seven top ideas in the stock market each and every month at seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. Now, there's a lot of factors that impact stock prices, including the business cycle itself. And there's quite a bit going on in the American macro economy right now. That's why I'm very excited to introduce our guest for today's show. Mike Singleton is the founder and senior analyst of Invictus Research. Uh, he joins me today from the great Northeast between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Mike, glad to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Simon. It's an honor to be here. You know, Mike, we, we, we represent typically individual investors here with Seven Investing. They're certainly going to be interested in what's going on in the economy right now, the impact and implications that will have on equities. We'll talk a little bit about stock valuations. We'll talk a little bit about the housing market as a leading indicator for asset prices. But maybe it'd be best for you to start with some of the research that you've done into the business cycle. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how things tend to follow cycles somewhat predictably over long periods of time and the research and the things that you found? Sure. Thanks, Simon. So first of all, I would say at Invictus, we're, we're pitching our own book a little bit because we are business cycle analysts. So uh, what do we mean by business cycle? Really, we mean three sub cycles, the real growth cycle, the inflation cycle, and the monetary policy cycle or interest rate cycle. And the reason that we care about those three sub cycles, which we sometimes shorten as just the business cycle more broadly, is because the business cycle drives uh, between 60 and 80% of the price action for individual stocks. And if you look at the sector level, it drives uh, a lot more than 60 or 80%, maybe as much as 100%. And you uh, look at the broader market or asset classes as a whole, it's, it's just more and more macro each level you go up. Uh, and so if you, um, if you care about why stocks are moving and you don't want to be uh, confused by Mr. Market, so to speak, you don't want to be uh, you know, waving your fists at, the, you know, at heaven when your portfolio is going up and down for reasons you don't understand, I think studying the business cycle is a very good idea. And I think it can enhance almost uh, anyone's stock picking process by overlaying a little bit of macro understanding. And let's chat a little bit about the components of the cycle, right? You've broken it down to the growth side, growth cycle, excuse me, the inflation cycle and the policy cycle. Perhaps you call that the interest rate cycle, but break each of those down for me. What kind of we, where we typically see in each one of those steps? So I guess, uh, well, that's a, that's a long, complicated question, <laughs> but I guess we could, um, maybe start with how the growth cycle and the policy cycle and the inflation cycle all interact and sort of go through the sequencing because I think that provides some really helpful context. So in a normal business cycle, what you'll see is, I'll start with inflation. Let's say inflation is running hot. The Fed sees that inflation is running hot. So what do they do? How do they react? What's their tool for bringing inflation back down to target? They raise interest rates, right? And when the Fed raises the Fed funds rate, which is their policy rate, it's the benchmark rate that, that influences everything else. When the Fed raises uh, the Fed funds rate, it increases rates for the entire U.S. interest rate complex, and it has considerable global influence as well. So what does that mean? It means when the Fed raises the federal funds rate, um, short-term uh, government bill rates go up. So the you know, three-month, six-month, one-year, two-year, there's about a 98% correlation between short rates and the Fed funds rate. But then what a lot of people don't understand is if you go out on the curve and look at the 10 year or the 20 year or the 30 year, the correlation is extremely high as well. Uh, the R squared for the relationship between the Fed funds rate and the 30 year treasury bill uh, bond yield is 0.8, right? So 80% of the price action in the long bond is explainable by what the Fed is doing at the short end, right? So uh, a lot of times people talk about the bond market, this discounting economic conditions or growth prospects for the economy. And that's true, it does, but the overwhelmingly most important factor is what the Fed is doing. Uh, even moving into private interest rate markets like uh, mortgage rates, the Fed has uh, an incredible amount of control over that market. So when they raise the, the Fed funds rate, they increase the mortgage rate as well, something like a 93% correlation between the 30 year fixed rate mortgage and the Fed funds rate. So moving away from all that bond market uh, uh, jargon, when the Fed raises the mortgage rate along with all the other rates, what happens? Well, demand for new homes goes down really quickly. And you can see that in the mortgage applications data. There's a very strong inverse correlation between mortgage rates and mortgage applications. So uh, essentially what the Fed does when it raises the mortgage rate is it stunts the housing market. And um, the good cycle tends to correspond to the housing market pretty closely. When people are buying new homes, they're oftentimes spending more money on their homes. They're buying what are called durable goods. So think 
uh, cars which go in your garage or your driveway or furniture or home appliances, big, expensive, financeable items, uh, right? And so the durable goods cycle tends to correspond to the manufacturing cycle because, of course, these durable goods have to be manufactured. So when the Fed raises rates, it slows down the housing market. Um, it slows down durable goods consumption. Uh, manufacturing companies have to respond to that reduced demand by producing less, right? Uh, and that's why we talk about industrial production or the ISM manufacturing PMI. Uh, and these, these production growth time series tend to have a very close correlation with the stock market. So if you look at the ISM manufacturing PMI and the S&P 500, and you look at them over time, they look very, very similar. So we want to track that data really closely. Um, in any case, if consumer demand for durable goods stays down long enough, uh, and manufacturing companies have to suppress production for long enough, obviously that's bad for their businesses. Uh, it eats away at their margins. And so they have to begin firing people. So that's the next step in the policy cycle. That's the next step in the Fed slowing down growth in order to slow down inflation, right? And uh, layoffs in the manufacturing sector are typically the, uh, and you could also say residential construction or goods producing industries more broadly. That's kind of the next step in the transmission uh, of monetary policy which eventually bleeds into services. So uh, that was a very long answer. I'll, I'll maybe pause there, but that's typically how growth, inflation, and policy interact in sort of a qualitative conceptual sense. They certainly are interconnected, Mike. And you know, we have seen now, you can call it maybe a 12-year bull market, right? Since the great financial crisis, you know, 2008, 2009, we've basically gone into 2021 with equities being very attractive options, right? Zero interest rate policy, you know, money was very cheap, step on the accelerator, go for the growth, very, very good for companies in the growth part of this cycle. Uh, but there are some people that would say, you know, this is a different market that is not as correlated to the ones in the past. We had a COVID global pandemic in 2020. We have a crisis right now going on in Eastern Europe with Russia and Ukraine. We've got supply chain problems with China. Is this time different, or do you think that this is highly correlated still to what you've typically seen with all of the cycles? And if it is similar to the previous cycles we've seen, what are some of the leading indicators that you're looking at right now? So uh, it's a good question. I would say that business cycles tend to follow self-repeating patterns, uh, which means that you can learn about what's likely to happen in the future from looking at the past. Uh, but we haven't really had a full business cycle since uh, the great financial crisis, really. We've had uh, the COVID recession, but the COVID recession did not follow a the typical sequencing of a business cycle because in some sense it was artificial or it was caused by an exogenous shock. Um, so I would say that if you want to learn about uh, where we might be going in terms of the U.S. economy, you're, you're better off looking at um, the great financial crisis or the dot-com bust or 1992 or other historical recessions uh, in terms of what might happen next. Leading indicators we're looking at, it's almost hard to explain some of our leading indicators uh, without using slides, but this is, this is what I'll say. Um, people talk about interest rate shocks or the long and variable lags of interest rate policy on the US economy. Uh, we saw what by all accounts should be a considerable interest rate shock in, um, in 2022, right? The Fed raised the Fed funds rate uh, you know, 450 basis points or something like that. The 10-year treasury yield increased um, 322 basis points between 2021 and 2023. So the question is, this big uh, spike in interest rates, how and when does this flow through the U.S. economy? And we run countless different back tests on this. And our answer, and this is one of the primary inputs into our forecasting models, is uh, uh, in the back half of 2023. That's where we see the interest rate shock uh, really hitting the U.S. economy. That's where you'll see the pain start to uh, affect the labor market. Right up to now, the labor market has been very strong. Um, so uh, because stocks typically trade atop the growth cycle um, and, and recessions are more or less called on the growth cycle, we can get more into the specific details of what a recession is and when the NBER will declare one officially. But essentially what we're saying is the, the big risk off is in the back half of 2023. Uh, right now, our models are saying Usually the way people delineate it is when does the labor market break? Like when is there a big nonlinear spike in the uh, claims data or the unemployment rate? Our expectation is November, December of 2023, or maybe even January of 2024. So we've seen layoffs in the tech industry. You think that the unemployment rate is going to increase even higher from that though, because that was maybe a little bit ahead of the rest of the economy, which is going to follow suit later this year? 
right? So, so, so these tech layoffs actually represent a relatively small fraction of the overall economy. So while there have been considerable layoffs in tech, and we hadn't really seen this many layoffs in tech since the dot-com bubble, uh, if you look at the overall labor market, uh, all of the industries and sectors of America put together, either through something like the unemployment rate or the claims data, they're actually pretty close to secular lows, right? Um, the unemployment rate is still 3.6%. It wasn't that long ago that economists thought the natural rate of unemployment was about 5%, right? right? That, was, uh, that was kind of the, the, the common, that was common knowledge, so to speak, uh, five or 10 years ago. And un initial jobless claims are not only at a cycle low, they're also at a secular low, uh, very, very low relative to history. And if you take initial jobless claims and you divide it by the size of the labor force, which is an adjustment that you really need to make to get an apples to apples comparison for today versus prior business cycles, because uh, the US population and therefore labor force has grown over the last 60 years or so. Um, initial jobless claims are lower than they've ever been going all the way back to the beginning of the time series in the 1960s. So. Uh, we do expect weakness in the labor market in the back half of 2023, but we also have to acknowledge that it's not happening yet. Uh, all of our coincident measures of labor market health still look pretty strong. And we agreed, Mike, not, not to have slides for this podcast. This is audio only, so there's nothing to talk to on the screen right now. But can you tell me a little bit about how you guys follow the industrial markets, you know, manufacturing PMI? How important is that to the analysis that you do? And I know that you said that some of the indices that you're looking at have actually turned negative in recent months. Right. So manufacturing is, is important for a lot of reasons. I guess the first and most obvious reason that we think it's important is it just has a very close correlation with the stock market and also market internals. So again, uh, if you take the year over year rate of change in the S&P 500 and paste it right on top of the ISM manufacturing PMI, which is a very widely cited measure of uh, manufacturing growth, they look really, really similar. Uh, so that's one reason to care about it because we care about the performance of stocks. Uh, at Invictus, we are market strategists. We're not uh, policymakers, right? We're not academics. So the reason we study any of these variables is, all, is to make better investment decisions, right? So when any time series has a super close correlation with the performance of the markets, uh, we're going to anchor to that time series. We're going to look at it a lot, right? So that's a big reason that we care about the, the ISM manufacturing PMI. Another reason is that market internals tend to correspond to it really closely as well. So if you took cyclical sectors over defensive sectors as a ratio, right? Uh, and, and measured it over the last 20 years or so, it looks just like the ISM manufacturing PMI. So when the manufacturing PMI is increasing, cyclicals virtually always outperform. And when it's declining, signifying slower manufacturing growth, defensives almost always outperform, right? So if we have a view that the manufacturing PMI is going to decline uh, until the middle of 2024, which you know not coincidentally is our view right now, then we should be overweight defensives. Doesn't mean you have to take all your risk off the table. Everyone has their own investment objectives. Um, but it does mean that it's time to be it's time to be playing defense, not offense, so to speak. And then uh, the second part is that uh, manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing sector, even though it's a small, relatively small portion of the U.S. economy, uh, you know, relative to other economies globally, or manufacturing, good spending is only about a third of total consumer spending versus services, uh, which is about two thirds. Of the U.S. is very services centric, but manufacturing tends to lead services, so it's a good leading indicator. And then, like I said earlier, it's also the transmission mechanism for monetary policy into services, right? When manufacturing layoffs happen, um, people spend less money on services and therefore services companies tend to lay people off as well. So, you know, when we look at the labor market data, when we look at the employment data, what are we looking at most specifically? What are we focusing on the most? We're looking at the manufacturing data, right? Because when layoffs start to happen in the manufacturing sector, that's kind of our signal that the next step of the business cycle is starting to take place. I do want to drill down into the implications and the decisions that the Fed faces here in just a minute. I do want to give just one moment for a sponsored read. Uh, our sponsor for this episode is Stocks Current. Stocks Current is your investment companion and guide that's helping individual investors just like you on their investment journey. They help new and seasoned investors alike by conducting research, providing analysis, and making recommendations. By joining Stocks Current, you'll get access to their recommendations, watch list, and real money portfolio. You receive real-time mobile notifications and email alerts of their activities in the real money portfolio. As a listener to our seven investing podcast, you'll also get an exclusive offer of 10% off as an executive membership. Use the unique code to take advantage of this special promotion. We'll include the text in our written piece for this podcast, but it's stockscurrent.com slash signup slash podcast 10. This membership comes with a 30 day, 100% money back guarantee. No questions asked. Join Stocks Current today and let them help you make the most 
of your investments. Back to Mike Singleton, who's the founder and senior analyst of Invictus Research. Uh, Mike, we talked a little bit about the implications about what to expect with stocks. It sounded like right now is a time to get defensive. Uh, some people might call that value investing. Some people might say staying away from cyclicals. Uh, but bigger picture, is that your your take on the stock market and equities right now, that you, you tend to stay away from things that would move along with that kind of decline in a lot of the production and manufacturing and industrial indices that you look at? Right. That, 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 that's about it. And it's important to understand, too, that all stocks are cyclical, right? So if you were to take the different, uh, there's 11 equity sectors, right? If you were to take the performance of the 11 equity sectors and do a correlation analysis with the ISM manufacturing PMI, which is to just say for, with the growth cycle, all of them have positive correlations with the economic growth cycle, but some tend to be more correlated and some tend to be less correlated. So uh, cyclical sectors tend to be like consumer discretionary, technology, industrials, energy, basic materials, financials, and defensives tend to be uh, what you'd expect, right? Healthcare, large cap healthcare, utilities, um, consumer staples. Again, they are exposed to the business cycle. If you go to the grocery store during a recession, you might buy hamburger instead of steak, but you're not going to stop going to the grocery store entirely. Uh, and so we also do some multi-asset work at Invictus. And one of our favorite allocations right now, as it has been for a little while, is, is, is treasury bills, which is sort of a cash alternative, or at least that's the way we think about it. And uh, we'll take a nominally risk-free 4 to 5% uh, yield right now, uh, given our economic outlook. We think that's not a bad trade-off to make. Yeah, you've got a great four block, you know, some of the research that you put out there is kind of breaking it down based on the inflation rates, you know, relative inflation rates and year over year comparisons and also the growth of the economy. It sounds like if I hear correctly, we're in the deflation bottom left quadrant, uh, where it seems like consumer stables and healthcare are going to outperform, at least in the research that you've shown, uh, whereas the underperforming sectors might be financial and energy, right? Right, right, exactly. And to be clear, when we say deflation at Invictus, we don't mean uh, negative inflation in year over year terms. We, we, have, we mean something very specific. We mean slower real growth and slower inflation in, in rate of change terms. So if inflation goes from 9.1% in June of 2022 to 6% today, uh, that's, that's not deflation technically because it's not negative, but it's disinflation and, and combined with slower real growth. That's what we mean when we say deflation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the clarification, Mike. And maybe that's is the perfect segue for kind of the final topic I wanted to chat about right now, which is the decision that Jay Powell and the Fed have got in front of them, right? Powell has been saying for at least since I can remember that his target inflation rate was 2%. Uh, we are still far above that right now, you know, CPI core inflation here for the US. But He's aggressively raised Fed fund rate, like you said. Uh, you know, it seems like this has been uh, more challenging to get down to 2% inflation than maybe was originally considered, uh, especially at a time where, like we said, it's after COVID. We've got a lot of free money going into the system. Uh, we saw from Silicon Valley Bank, you know, a lot of the banks were flush with cash and they put it into long duration bonds that turned on them here recently with the yield curve inflation or yield curve inversion and other things. Uh, what do you make of, of kind of the Fed's policy right now? Are, are we getting back to 2% inflation? Uh, do you think that there's more Fed funds increases here in 2023? And uh, what are kind of some of the options you see that are on the table right now? And then what are the implications for asset classes based on each one of those options? I know that's a huge question. That's probably a three hour discussion right there. But kind of what do you think that the Fed, uh, the decisions that the Fed faces right now look like? So I'll, I'll answer the first question first. Are we going to 2%, back to 2% inflation? I think the answer is uh, yes, at least over the next 12 months or so, call it next nine to 12 months. Why do I say that? How can I be confident about that? Well, it's a really simple thesis, right? If we see a recession, uh, recessions are virtually always disinflationary events. Why? Because prices, the price of consumer goods, the price of whatever is always the intersection of supply and demand, right? And recessions mean the aggregate demand curve is moving way in. And so all is equal, that will bring prices down. And if you look at the last uh, 20 recessions, we have data going back to uh, 1910s on inflation and, and NBER recessions. Um, inflation pretty much always goes down whenever there's a recession. And frequently it goes down very, very quickly. So we think to bet, to bet on something like an inflationary recession, which is something that we've heard before, uh, is, is counter to economic history and economic logic unless you expect a coincident major supply shock at the same time, which uh, Invictus is pretty much impossible to forecast, but it's certainly not in our base case. So 2% uh, inflation, why? Well, because we think there's going to be a recession. Your second question, will the Fed continue to hike? 
That's a more difficult question. So for a while, for a long time, we've been saying uh, our outlook on monetary policy is hawkish. Policy is going to get tighter. Rates are going higher. And for a long time, that was a, a good call, right? We were right about that. Uh, our outlook per the last monthly market outlook that we did for April, our, our monetary policy view has switched to neutral. And uh, the reason we say that, first of all, you know, I fully acknowledge that economic conditions still suggest that the Fed would hike, right? Why do I say that? Well, uh, services inflation, which represents about two thirds of consumer spending, like I said earlier, is still running at between six and 8% annualized, depending on which numbers that you're looking at. And uh, durable goods inflation, which has really been the primary driver of this inflation since June, has shown signs of beginning to rebound a little bit. At Invictus, we don't think that that is really going to culminate into anything material, but it's a policy risk. The Fed sees it, the Fed doesn't want it to happen. So you would think, uh, if two thirds of the US economy is still inflating at six to 8% and the primary driver of disinflation seems to be picking its head up again, uh, that should be an environment where the Fed is likely to hike, especially since the employment data remains very strong, right? So they've got their dual mandate, you know, price stability and full employment. Employment is, you know, full right now. It's, it's, as, it's as tight a labor market as we've seen in a long time and inflation is still hot. You know, it almost seems like a no brainer. The Fed should be hiking. The reason that I say that uh, we are not hawkish on monetary policy right now, even though the economic, the economic conditions say that we should be, is really based on our back tests. So there are a number of leading indicators that we look at. Probably the simplest is just looking at the two-year yield. The US two-year yield tends to lead the Fed funds rate by about three months with a 98% correlation. So that is not a correlation that we generally want to bet against. Uh, that's as you know, as close a correlation as you'll find in financial markets generally. And the two-year yield has broken down really since, um, I guess it was the, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank debacle on March 8th. That was the, I think that was the peak in the two-year yield. And we saw a four sigma move lower in the two-year yield. We saw it make a new lower low. We saw it break down uh, below support, below 4.1 to 4.2%. And what that suggests is, uh, given the relationship we just talked about, that the Fed will be cutting in the next three months or so. Now, could the two-year reprice higher? Sure, certainly, right? Uh, is that a bet that we necessarily want to make at Invictus, uh, uh, given that, that historical 98% correlation? No, not really. And if we are going to see a recession in the back half of 2023 due to hikes that, have already, that are already sort of flowing through the economy, um, I don't know that it makes sense to position your portfolio uh, for higher rate, for higher rates in this, in this, uh, just given the, the the weight of the evidence in the in the economy and the financial markets right now, so it's a tricky situation. We don't think uh, getting super short duration right now makes sense. Uh, we don't need to make a bet on this one way or the other. There's not a high risk reward um, in making a bet either way right now. Yeah, absolutely. And then one last question, Mike, you know, while I'm thinking about it, I don't mean to open up an entire new can of worms on this, but something that we didn't have to compare to in the past was cryptocurrencies, right? We, there's a lot of headlines out there about Bitcoin right now, but this is another asset class that, you know, some people are saying it's going to replace gold. Uh, some people are going to say it's going to be an alternative, you know, for 401k plans and retirement accounts to, to, to cash or money market funds. Some say it's a very, very high risk investment, as we've certainly seen in the last couple of years. Do you think that cryptocurrencies has any impact on your models uh, or your expectations uh, for, for how you're planning things going forward? Is, or, or is crypto just completely not a, not a factor in, in all of the modeling that you're doing right now? So we do look at crypto. We spend a, a decent amount of time on it. We probably spend more time on the traditional asset classes. So I'd say we're equity focused, but we also do bonds, commodities, and currencies and, uh, and a little bit of crypto. It's really pretty simple with, with crypto, I think. Uh, crypto does incredibly well in economic environments where uh, one, the Fed is easing and two, real economic growth is accelerating, right? And uh, historically, you've really just needed one of those to see crypto do pretty well. So um, what's happening right now? Are we seeing any of that? Well, growth is still slowing and we expect it to slow for a while. So that's a big red mark against crypto. Uh, policy we're neutral on right? We, we could see it start to ease, you know, at some point in the next three to six months. But we think it's a little bit early to make that high conviction bet on crypto because crypto is so heavily leveraged to those factors, right? Um, so we're, uh, 
probably neutral to bearish on crypto. I think it's probably fair to say that for an asset that's as high beta as Bitcoin, or certainly anything that sits you know, underneath Bitcoin in the crypto universe, if there's a recession, it's probably not going to go up. Uh, and so, you know, we would love to buy, you know, buy the dip in crypto at the right time, but our model suggests that now is not the right time. Absolutely. Once again, Mike Singleton, he is the uh, senior analyst and the founder of Invictus Research. You can learn more about them at Invictus, I-N-V-I-C-T-U-S research.com. Mike, a real pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for joining me on the 7 Investing Podcast today. Thanks for having me, Simon. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to this edition of our 7 Investing Podcast, where we are here to empower you to invest in your future. Have a great day, everyone.